been waiting patiently, and let's get started. I'm just going to hide one of you in sight. Um, thank you to our visitors, and good luck to our students who are finishing their last week of classes and heading off to different kinds of exams. It is my great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Dami Roderick, who today will discuss the challenges that nations face as they try to effectively take advantage of globalization. As you know, today's lecture is part, am I coming up, Mark? Yeah. Is part of um, a program of events sponsored by the Bernard Schwartz Forum <coughs> on Constructive Capitalism at SICE. So who is Bernard Schwartz? He's a very successful businessman who believes in the power of a market economy to produce great gains to mankind so long as the democratic government is its partner with wise and compassionate policies to foster growth. His purpose in establishing the forum was to support serious academic inquiry into policies which both sustain and widely distribute the benefits of growth through productivity in modern economies, but also do it in ways that I think Professor Robert is particularly well suited uh, to discuss. Our forum is just one way in which his philanthropy fosters research and dissemination of constructive ideas which can shed light in the controversial debates relating to globalization and its impact on prosperity and social harmony. Seiss has structured this as a high-level lecture and symposia series to take advantage of the substantial research and continued controversy. By providing this forum, it's our hope that we will get uh, further discussion going both within our community and outside. <coughs> it's a special occasion for us today on this last session and, uh, and our thanks uh, to our wonderful organizers throughout the year to have Danny Roderick at size to speak about globalization. And we're genuinely excited by the opportunity. I first encountered Professor Roderick's work at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, which published his landmark volume on globalization in 1997. Danny's book of political economy, which questioned some cherished assumptions of modern liberal economic theory, <laughs> demanded serious attention because of his superb credentials as an economist. There is a kinship, I think, with the, more with the other serious works of Joe Stiglitz and Paul Krugman, or I should say, of, with the more serious of their own works, when the best economists tackle theory in the name of social justice. I'm eagerly looking forward to reading uh, the newest work, The Globalization Paradox. Indeed, I tried to purchase it two weeks ago at our great bookstore in Washington, Politics and Books, <laughs> but it was sold out with new orders on the way. That gives you a sense of his following, but we will hear today something of the sweeping historical review, which he undertakes to demonstrate the tensions between globalization demands uh, on, uh, for national competitiveness and the requirements of democratic governments who must remain responsive to the safety nets and other public needs which their citizens have every right to demand. Um, Professor Roberts' many academic accomplishments are in the program and the, in the uh, advertisements. So rather than take this podium away, um, let me invite Danny Roderick to speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jessica, for a very generous uh, introduction. It's very nice to be here um, and at size. Um, I, I feel particular kinship to this audience coming from a, uh, what I consider to be a sister institution, given our, our sort of very similar kinds of concerns and very similar composition of student body um, at, at the Kennedy School. Um, I guess what I think of what I do uh, is, is less of um, rethinking economic theory uh, as uh, and, and more of uh, um, applying existing economic theory and preventing the misuse of economic theory. Um, in, 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 as I try to explain in this book and in, in many of my other writings, um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, um, the simplistic and unrealistic and uh, uh, application of uh, textbook economics that, uh, that often gets us in trouble. Uh, but. Uh, what get, should get out of trouble is not necessarily uh, jettisoning that theory, but 
actually moving from the uh, uh, Econ 101 version of the theory to the Econ 201 version, uh, which is that often uh, the, enlighten the enlightenment that we need when we approach uh, very difficult public policy questions and questions in, public in, in, in globalization, uh, the answers are often in, in economic theory as well, uh, because economic theory is not just sort of one uniform um, uh, sort of body of work. It's really much more of a toolkit, um, and um, that's one of my uh, uh, intellectual heroes, uh, uh, Carlos Diaz Alejandro, once wrote, uh, um, and he was saying this something like 20 years ago, he said that by now any graduate student by picking his model appropriately can arrive at any policy conclusion he or she desires. Um, and that was, as I said, some 20, 25 years ago, and economic theory has evolved, and then just think how much more license you have these days. Um, so the, 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 the challenge really is, is, is to use, is to sort of figure out uh, which economic framework, which theory is the most relevant one to any particular kind of, of context. And I think this is where uh, I think the, the, the economics profession has often failed, uh, most recently, of course, uh, in the context of uh, financial globalization, uh, where we put too much emphasis on one body of theory, which emphasized uh, market efficiency and self-regulation, uh, didn't put enough emphasis on, on other uh, bodies of theory, also in, in economics, uh, uh, emphasizing uh, asymmetric information, agency costs, uh, uh, bubbles, and so forth. Um, and, and most seriously, of course, by em not just emphasize one at the expense of the other, but actually sort of uh, put uh, almost universal weight on uh, the likelihood that just one set of models were the right one uh, is against the others. And I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's those kinds of, avoiding those kinds of mistakes are, 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 are going to be quite important. Now, as Jessica said, this, um, my talk is based on, on, on my book uh, called The Globalization uh, Paradox. It really should have been called The Globalization Trilemma, but my, uh, my publisher said no book with the title of Trilemma. <laughs> Paradox. Why the trilemma? Um, uh, you'll see. Uh, in terms of, of just sort of um, uh, starting out with uh, the uh, key uh, analytical building blocks um, uh, in the book, uh, I would emphasize uh, three ideas uh, at, this, at the outset. Um, the first one is really um, a, a corollary to um, uh, Adam Smith's well-known dictum that the division of labor is limited by the extent of, uh, of, of the market. And my corollary, which is sort of the first stepping stone in this book, uh, is that the extent of the market is in turn limited uh, by the scope of wor workable regulation or governance. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is the idea that, that sort of markets are in self-standing institutions in order to produce the kinds of outcomes that we want them to produce, whether it's efficiency uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's material well-being, uh, prospects for economic development and growth. Uh, markets need to be embedded in a broad range of non-market institutions. Uh, you need these non-market institutions so that markets can exist. So you need property rights institutions, contract enforcement institutions. Uh, you need regulatory institutions in order to, put, to ensure that markets uh, can work as advertised, to take into account problems of asymmetric information, externalities, uh, scale economies, anti-competitive behavior. Um, all of those things require regulatory <laughs> institutions in order to ensure markets work well. Ever since Keynes, we know that markets require stabilizing institutions as well, monetary and fiscal institutions, to ensure that, um, that, that the business cycle is moderated. And, and finally, but certainly not least, markets require legitimizing institutions. They require various institutions to ensure that the outcomes they generate are consistent with the values and norms of society. In modern times, of course, that has required various mechanisms of social protection, welfare, uh, the welfare state, um, uh, various uh, uh, redistributive mechanisms, and ultimately, of course, political democracy, which I view in an instrumental sense as, as one of the key legitimizing uh, uh, and supporting institutions of markets, because ultimately, uh, you know, markets are, are, are embedded in these sort of broader uh, democratic governance mechanisms. So this is the first point, that 
that if you want markers to, be, to, need to work well, they need to be embedded in a very thick set of, 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 of governance institutions. Um, and when markets go beyond the reach of these governance mechanisms, then you're going to run into problems both of legitimacy um, and of uh, instability and, and, and inefficiency. Um, the second uh, key point uh, is that uh, when you think about where this, where and how these governance mechanisms come from, um, that today the main locus of legitimate governance still remains by and large the nation state. Uh, because it's the nation state where the most active politics is still um, organized. It's the nation state that is still uh, the locus of democratic deliberation. So when you look at the, the governance of markets, um, basically the, most of the action still remains at the level of, of nation states. Uh, and third, uh, that uh, there exist legitimate differences across nation states on the shape that these governance mechanisms ought to take. Um, so that there are legitimate differences having to do with the historical trajectories of different countries, with the risk preferences of different countries, with the needs according to their uh, level of development that different countries face, that the type of regulatory or stabilizing, uh, uh, legitimizing institutions that different countries may need can be quite different, and that this is uh, uh, this, these these sources of differences are legitimate in the sense that they are uh, the result of the uh, democratic preferences expressed by uh, the the, um, uh, the electoral uh, um, uh, bodies in, in, in different nation states, um, and that we ought to uh, understand that uh, that this is a this is sort of uh, that, that these differences in uh, the methods of regulation or methods of stabilization of, of, of governance of, of, of markets uh, is not simply something that we want to minimize uh, at the expense of market integration and globalization, but it is something that we ought to be optimizing against, uh, treating this uh, as, 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 as a given and as, as <coughs> being uh, driven by, by legitimate needs uh, of, of, of different uh, democracies. Um, the uh, key point in the book is that when you uh, put these ideas together, uh, that there are in fact uh, inherent limits to how far you can uh, push globalization. Uh, um, something that I call hyper-globalization in the book, which is sort of this textbook ideal of a world economy that has become almost as, as integrated as a national economy, where, the, where nation states no longer impose transactions costs on international trade and finance, that hyper-globalization in that sense is actually something that is unachievable, um, and that in fact uh, we benefit more from empowering nation states, uh, which is where these legitimate governance mechanisms arise from, by empowering nation states so that we can actually have strong governance mechanisms for markets, even if uh, it will come in some areas at the expense of, of giving up on the goal of, of hyper-globalization. Um, so this is, in a way, it's also historically uh, uh, um, a specific uh, conclusion in the sense that I'm not sure I would reach this conclusion in the 1950s uh, when the role of global markets was limited <coughs> relative to the role of nation states. Um, but the point is that we've reached now a point where um, we, uh, uh, we um, uh, the greater threat uh, is that of constraining uh, the room within which nation states uh, function, uh, then uh, the threat of a, a significant um, uh, 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 collapse of uh, global cooperation in the direction of, of an open uh, world economy. Um, so these are the rather uh, abstract ideas. The book is meant to be uh, accessible and, 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 uh, and, 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 uh, and enjoyable to read. So there are lots of stories in the book. Um, one that I start out with, which I will uh, also do here, uh, which is a story about beavers. Um, it goes back to the 17th century. I use this story to eliminate uh, the close relationship between uh, markets and governance. Uh, and in this particular context, the relationship between long distance trade and rule. Uh, that the fact that trade and rule have historically have always uh, gone together. Uh, the virtue of the story about the beaver trade is that it makes this connection very transparent. 
but as uh, globalization has evolved over the course of centuries and has taken different forms, uh, um, the close connection between trade and rule, between markets and governance, um, uh, hasn't evaporated, it just has taken different, uh, different shapes, different forms. And, 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 and that also provides us with some kind of a ground uh, of work with which we can uh, imagine what form this relationship might take as, as we go forward. Well, the story about beavers is, is how, uh, as a result of very great demand for uh, beaver fur in, in Britain during the 17th century, um, uh, two um, French-Canadian adventurers called um, uh, Radisson and Le Grossier, um, who were in uh, what was called then French, uh, a, a, a French colonial, um, um, uh, part of the French colonial rule in, in, in French Canada, um, decided to um, evade the close uh, control that the French Canadian uh, authorities had over the beaver trade and, um, and proposed to uh, then King Charles II um, uh, that they open up a naval route uh, through Hudson Bay um, and uh, reach the native uh, Indians, uh, the native Canadians who were hunting the beaver uh, through Hudson's Bay. Uh, trade with them in that way, and then sort of manage to um, uh, import the beaver uh, to Britain uh, through this uh, through this naval route. So they enlisted um, a uh, cousin of King Charles II, uh, a fellow by the name of Prince Rupert, um, who had uh, good connections besides the king, lots of wealthy friends. So they uh, were able to finance a. Uh, a, a couple of ships uh, to try out to see if, in fact, this business plan, as we would call it today, uh, was uh, um, had any prospect. Um, so uh, they um, uh, they went on this trip um, uh, in 1668. is the first uh, the first trip in June 3rd, um, and then after three months, uh, they finally make landing on Hudson's Bay. Um, and they make their first contact uh, with the natives now for the first time from the north, evading the French Canadians and the French uh, um, colonial um, uh, uh, authorities. Um, and then they, they winter at the shores of Hudson's Bay. They buy um, uh, beaver from the, uh, the, the Indians and then uh, come back. Um, and uh, they have their first sale of uh, beaver fur in uh, in place called Garway's Coffee House in London in 1671. Um, and this is the first time that, that Canadian beaver is, is actually being sold in Britain. Uh, these ca coffee houses were uh, sort of, uh, typical um, meeting places for auctions of various kinds of, of, of uh, commodities being, uh, uh, being imported. Um, so having now uh, established that the business plan had prospect, that you could actually sort of had you could trade with the, uh, you could evade uh, the French Canadians and you could trade with the uh, uh, native Indians and get access to uh, beaver fur uh, through this particular route. Then they did, um, uh, Prince Rupert and his two French Canadian adventurer friends did what every, that every entrepreneur in the 17th century would do, uh, which is to petition the king for a trading monopoly. Um, this is, after all, the mercantile era, um, and this is how business is organized. So they go to King Charles II, and the King Charles II promptly uh, grants uh, what is now called um, a, the Hudson's Bay Company, is the short name of it, uh, but the full name of it was the Honorable, the Governor and Company of Merchant Adventures Trading into Hudson's Bay. Um, and this company now receives a charter uh, from King Charles II. You see a picture of it there. Uh, and I have a short section of it uh, which actually describes what the charter is about. I'm not going to read it all, uh, but what's interesting about the charter is that it not just grants Hudson's Bay Company uh, a monopoly trading privileges, uh, it also grants uh, uh, Hudson's Bay Company complete property rights over the entire land area that comprises <coughs> all the rivers that flow into Hudson's Bay, uh, an area that is yet to be explored. So actually King Charles II has no idea how, long, how large an area is granting to a private company. Um, and the, the, the charter says, um, 
um, and so this is the second, um, says the second, uh, well, actually this is the whole thing is interesting. Um, Whereas our dear and entirely beloved cousin Prince Rupert and others have at their own great cost and a charge undertaken an expedition um, uh, uh, and have, have already made such discoveries, uh, whereas there may probably arise very great, great advantage to us and our kingdom, do give, grant, and confirm the sole trade and commerce of all those seas. So this is the part about the granting of monopoly trade privileges. Uh, and further, this is the last paragraph now, and further, we do create and constitute the said company for the time being and their successors, the true and absolute lords and proprietors of the same territory, limits, and places aforesaid. Okay, what is that territory? Again, it's the entire territory where with all the waters, uh, all the rivers, it's actually described, uh, it says, all those seas, straits, bays, rivers, lakes, creeks, and sounds in whatsoever latitude they shall be that lie within the entrance of the straits commonly called Hudson Straits, together with all the lands and territory upon the countries, coasts, and confines of the seas, bays, lakes, rivers, streets, and sounds aforesaid, that are not already actually possessed by or granted to any of the subjects or possessed by the subjects of any other Christian prince. So if there's a you know, Christian prince, it's okay, you can't have it. If it's not a Christian prince, it's yours. Well, this territory, it turns out, was, is about 40% uh, of today's Canada. Um, and uh, Hudson's Bay uh, becomes now the sole owner. This the private company becomes the sole ruler, owner of this land. So you can all but name for the centuries that follow, uh, Hudson's Bay Company not engaged in the monopoly trade of beaver fur to Britain, but it also has become uh, the ruler, the uh, government uh, in all but name of a huge uh, tract of land, 40% uh, of Canada. <coughs> Uh, it means that Hudson's Bay Company makes laws, it administers justice, runs an army, can wage war, can pacify the natives, can impose all kinds of rules and contracts on the natives, um, and uh, eventually it issues its coins and notes. Uh, um, of course, this is a model that, that you know, uh, Hudson's Bay Company you may not have heard of before, uh, but you've heard about the East India Company. East India Company wasn't all that different. Uh, they basically ran India, um, had exactly the same kind of, of, of property rights over large uh, swaths of land, um, and they acted uh, as uh, in, in any but um, uh, sort of name uh, as, 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 a, as a state uh, until eventually their powers were turned over directly to the British Crown in 1858 uh, when they proved incapable uh, of putting down the, uh, the revolt, uh, uh, the mutiny. Uh, in 1858. Now, now we think about sort of this method of organizing long-distance trade. When is that you're not just sort of entrusting the trade to monopolists, but you're actually entrusting all property rights and uh, rulemaking powers uh, to a private company um, uh, so that they can rule over your uh, your trade partners? Is a very archaic notion. Uh, that may is sort of re the result of, of uh, very you know, misleading thinking of a you know, mercantilist bent that was all set uh, 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 right once Adam Smith came about and came around and told us about uh, how uh, you know it, it, you should you should um, you should get rid of mercantilist uh, thinking and and, uh, and get rid of monopolies and so forth, but we forget. Um, that um, what the Hudson's Bay Company and similar um, um, chartered trading monopolies did and the, and the way that they were uh, uh, um, constituted was a solution to a problem that is always intrinsic in international trade, in long distance trade, which is that how, who is going to create the rules and how are you going to impose the rules? Look at all the things that the um, um, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had to do. Uh, they had to undertake all the investments in the infrastructure uh, to ensure that, in fact, the trade could take place. So, uh, ensure in uh, the, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, establish the possibility um, and safety of the naval route, uh, undertake all the exploration inland, uh, build these uh, forts, uh, you know, establish relationships with Indians, do all the market research to figure out 
what you could sell the Indians in return for getting the, the beaver from them, um, and, and you need to create this long-term relationship. In other words, somebody had to establish a framework of property rights and contract enforcement and peace and security so that this trade could take place. Uh, within a country, we don't think about that because within a country, markets are already embedded within the system of rules and, and, and uh, regulations of that country, of that particular uh, jurisdiction. But across different jurisdictions, across different countries, um, uh, there is the question of how are you going to sort of operate across these different jurisdictions. Charter trading companies was in fact an institutional form designed to deal with this problem. And the quid pro quo from the perspective of the British Crown was that we are going to empower a, um, a private company uh, to invest in all the, all the prerequisites, all the governance mechanisms, all the rules and regulations that you need to have in order to have trade, albeit one that wasn't particularly favorable to the native Indians, uh, and in return we give uh, the, uh, this private company monopoly rights, the rents uh, that they can use uh, for that. Um, now, uh, this, as I said at the outset, is a particularly sort of uh, naked mechanism uh, that shows how trade and rule had to go uh, together. Uh, but of course, it wasn't uh, the only mechanism. And over time, uh, as the change, um, as, as uh, the forms in which uh, trade and rule went together and the mechanisms of governance that underlay globalization changed. Um, in the, during the 19th century, um, there were, uh, you know, sort of, you know, when you talk about the history of globalization, typically people start from the 19th century, which you think about as the, as the first great era of, of globalization. Uh, the institutional mechanisms that underlay the 19th century model of, of globalization was, I, I would say, two things. One was, you know, a belief system, a system of values and norms that underlay sort of a common pattern of behavior on the part of uh, the Western European nations, and that was a belief system that uh, said that the major way, the, the way that you run your economy is through the gold standard rules. So the gold standard, which uh, um, enabled uh, free capital mobility um, and, and the explosion in, in, in lending and, and borrowing across, uh, across national borders, uh, was uh, made possible through uh, the gold standard. Uh, but it was also made possible when you went away from uh, um, Western Europe to the periphery, to the world at large, <coughs> was made possible through imperialism, either in overt form or in disguised form, uh, because you had either informal mechanisms of empire, such as gunboat diplomacy to enforce that debt contracts were paid by uh, areas in the uh, periphery, or there were sort of one-sided free trade treaties imposed by imperial powers on the states like uh, the Ottomans, the Chinese, the Japanese. Um, or you had sort of explicit form of uh, imperialism, which is actually you go and rule. Uh, so in India, for example, there was continuity uh, when the East India Company simply transferred uh, its, uh, its, its, its powers to the British Crown directly. So you had the British Empire now ruling India as opposed to a private company, but other than that, the fact that these rules were being imposed uh, from the outside didn't change. Uh, Neil Ferguson, um, uh, you know, who's, uh, you know, I, I like his, his ode to imperialism, his, his book on imperialism is a nice uh, uh, quote. It says, no organization in history has done, has done more to promote the free movement of goods, capital, and labor than the British in the early 20th centuries. Uh, so, and, and he calls this anti-globalization. Now, you can, you're free to think whatever you think about whether this was a good thing or a bad thing, and things were good. But you know, there's not much disputing the facts that the British Empire was, in fact, a, you know, a, a, a marvelous mechanism uh, to sustain globalization because it was a way of ensuring that everybody operated by the same rules and that the British traders and everybody else didn't have to worry about the restless nature, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, 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 and renaming the contract and, and, uh, and, and, and destroying the uh, sort of ships of, of the local traders or, or, or killing the, 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 the foreign. Uh, uh, um, now, uh, in both the, the sort of the earlier mercantilist and sort of uh, the 19th century models of globalization had uh, a couple of disadvantages. <laughs> 
Uh, one, of course, is from the perspective of the, the, uh, the periphery, uh, was that they both relied on the subjugation of the local population uh, uh, by two foreign powers. So the, the, you know, the, 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 quick, the, the downside of being able to trade was that you had to trade, you were under the rule of, of uh, the outsider, and that meant that you, know, you had to suffer all the terms of trade consequences and, and everything else uh, um, uh, that, uh, that that meant. Um, and the second disadvantage, and one that was felt uh, even in the center, was that under the gold standard, of course, you know you um, you had the subjugation of domestic economic considerations to the requirements of international markets. So what that meant was that if domestic economy was being run under the gold standard rules, it meant that uh, um, that uh, you could not interfere in world um, in capital markets in, in the free flow of uh, finance across national borders. Uh, you couldn't alter uh, the, the fixed peg against the gold, so you couldn't have an independent monetary or exchange rate policy. Um, so as long as you did that, that was fine. But you know, uh, if you were thinking of, of really uh, uh, engaging in what today we would call national economic policy in macroeconomic or other spheres, that was really outside the rules of the, of the gold standard. That was great for maintaining open global finance. Uh, but it wasn't very good if you wanted to have room for domestic economic policy. Now, um, uh, when countries at the center in Europe became progressively more democratic, uh, so that there was much greater demand for domestic economic management to respond to domestic economic needs, whether that might be uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the challenges of economic growth or challenges of unemployment, and as, of course, the periphery became independent. Sort of both of these sort of underpinnings of uh, how uh, the older versions of, of globalization uh, became uh, untenable. Um, the, the Bretton Woods uh, compromise, the Bretton Woods model of globalization that uh, came out of the Second World War uh, was devised uh, on the back of the lessons uh, that uh, Keynes and his contemporaries derived from those earlier uh, experience, from that earlier experience with, with globalization. Um, uh, in, in particular, the lesson from the uh, aborted attempt by Britain to rejoin the gold standard uh, during the interwar period, uh, when Britain ultimately in 1931 had to get off the gold standard in order to be able to respond to the clamor for low interest rates, again, what today we would call a deflationary monetary policy, uh, which gold standard rules prevented uh, uh, Britain from embarking on. Um, and the big lesson that uh, Keynes drew from that uh, was that, in fact, you needed, if you wanted to have good rules, you needed, you needed to make and to ensure uh, there was enough domestic space, uh, enough space for domestic policy requirements. Uh, Keynes, of course, thought about that mostly in the context of macroeconomic policies, um, policies uh, dealing with uh, managing the business cycle and, and dealing with the problems of, of, of unemployment. Um, uh, and and the, the, the vision of globalization that emerged from the Bretton Woods, under, largely under the influence of Keynes, was in fact a, a limited, a thin version of globalization that prioritized domestic needs over the needs of uh, integrated global markets. Uh, so that meant that in the uh, Bretton Woods regime, countries would have uh, room for, uh, to conduct their own Keynesian policies, um, monetary and fiscal policies to, uh, to counter the business cycle. They would have room to erect their own particular versions of the welfare state and the social protection mechanisms. Um, and that developing countries, those areas in the periphery, would not have the room to conduct uh, active industrial or economic restructuring policies uh, to uh, get on the bandwagon of industrialization and economic development. And so this room for Keynesian macro <coughs> policies, room for the creation of welfare states, room for activist industrial restructuring policies uh, uh, was the result of the various design features of the Bretton Woods system, the fact that capital controls were enshrined in the system, uh, very importantly, uh, Keynes said in 1945, he said that when we envisaged 
capital controls. He said, we, didn't, we don't think of them as a temporary expedient. We think of them as a permanent ingredient of the system because he understood that you really needed uh, a, a capital controls as a permanent feature of the system to open up room for domestic macroeconomic management. Um, the GATT uh, um, was a regime full of exceptions that precisely allowed the conduct of industrial policy, the conduct of, of, uh, of, of, of a, a wide range of, of trade and industrial policy. We think of the GATT as a significant um, um, episode of trade liberalization. It was, but it was in large part because it enabled very healthy economic growth on the part of individual countries, which in turn sort of uh, proceeded to, to progressively liberalize. And even then, the amount of trade liberalization that actually took place under the GATT was highly partial by the standards of the World Trade Organization because it was largely limited to manufacturers, it was largely limited to advanced industrial countries, with developing countries left free to do whatever they pleased, even in manufacturing, uh, you know, large you know, chunks of it were progressively left out uh, as the uh, cap, as the as textile and clothing exception under the MFA or the various other sort of uh, arrangements like the voluntary export restrictions and, and so forth. Um, so it was uh, very much a, in the same uh, sort of uh, principle of a compromise uh, that what my, my, my colleague uh, John Ruggie has called the, uh, the embedded compromise of embedded liberalism. Uh, which was that that uh, uh, that you you create a world economy, but you're not maximizing uh, international economic integration. Instead, you're empowering domestic uh, domestic economies uh, to uh, to conduct uh, their own policies um, and with a relatively thin layer of international rules uh, under a system of, of multilateral uh, multilateral governance. Um, now. I think uh, we significantly began to depart from uh, the nature from the Bretton Woods uh, uh, Compromise um, from the 1980s onwards. Um, and uh, the, the today, our model of globalization is one that I would uh, characterize as one that uh, is, is, is much more uh, concerned with trying to approximate what I called earlier as hyper-globalization, as a push for hyper-globalization. Uh, it's one that is significantly less uh, concerned about the need to retain policy autonomy for uh, nation states. In fact, it views um, uh, the reduction of that space for national policy making in large part as desirable because it facilitates uh, harmonization, it facilitates global rules. Uh, and therefore facilitates hybrid globalization. Um, and I think, uh, to a large extent, I interpret the various problems of the world economy uh, in the last two decades or so as, as the result of this sort of the overpushing uh, of this model. I think one is in those areas where uh, international institution building has significantly advanced in the direction of hybrid globalization. Uh, the result has been a very important legitimacy deficit in World Trade Organization is a key example of that. Um, uh, in areas where we have not been able to provide the institutional uh, infrastructure, as in financial globalization, the result has been instability and inefficiency. And those are, in fact, the dual costs of trying to push uh, uh, markets beyond what governance can sustain. Uh, when uh, you seem to be successful, because you are extending governance, but you are overriding the legitimate and diversity needs of, of, of governments, then you get into problems of legitimacy. The, the, the fact that the two world trade organizations probably took the world's least popular organization um, uh, uh, today. Or when you actually explicitly fall short of developing those governance mechanisms, you get uh, um, uh, the case of markets going haywire, uh, as we have in the case of, of the last of the sort of series of financial crises we've experienced in the last uh, few decades. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, ironically, of course, uh, the greatest successes from a developmental standpoint uh, of the last two or three decades, uh, which are uh, Ch China and a few other Asian countries, are precisely the successes of countries that have played the game, the globalization game, not by the hyper-globalization rules, but by Bretton Woods rules. Um, that that uh, what uh, China's model has always been one where uh, they take advantage of world markets, but they leave themselves enough room. 
We have uh, capital controls. We have uh, explicit, explicit, explicit views of trade and industrial policies and significant guarding of national sovereignty over a wide range of economic policy areas um, that enables the uh, economy to diversify, to restructure itself, and then uh, take advantage of world markets accordingly. And the countries that have played by the hyper-globalization rules, and I think Latin American countries are the chief example there, in fact have done quite badly in the last uh, uh, two decades, even if you leave aside the debt crisis, um, and have done so badly not only vis-a-vis -vis the Asian countries, but they've done actually badly relative to their own experience under the import substitution period. Um, so, uh, this is where we are. Um, I present in the book um, sort of, you know, a set of, of, of options uh, by way of, of my uh, trilemma. Uh, and the way, and the trilemma is basically this, that we have an option of uh, trying to reach for hyper-globalization uh, in a context where the world is still divided into different national polities. In other words, we have a divided global polity. Uh, but the only way we can do that is if each individual polity is actually willing to put on what Tom Friedman famously called the golden straitjacket. And of course, Tom Friedman here is referring to the gold standard because it's the same idea. Uh, that if you want coexistence of world market with national domestic policy makers, it's only possible if domestic policy makers uh, abide by certain rules and they, they forswear any independent policy action. This was the idea behind the global, the, um, the uh, uh, gold standard. Uh, this would be the idea today if you really were to believe that the world for trade and investment is completely uh, free where each individual policy maker would be constrained from doing something for fear that capital flight might be the result if they do something that departs from some sense of uh, what, the, what the norm is. Um, so the downside of this, as, as Tom Friedman uh, said, uh, is that it really significantly requires the shrinking of your politics. Um, and that's why this, um, uh, this, uh, this option is one that is feasible only to the extent that uh, the, the, the scope for democratic politics uh, becomes uh, significantly narrowed. Um, so, uh, you know, so Tom Friedman's image again was that, that you know, countries that put on the golden straight jacket, uh, their politics becomes a choice between Coke and Pepsi, uh, and no other sort of local flavors get allowed because it's really only sort of a narrow range of difference that is actually allowed uh, from what your trading partners or major powers, uh, uh, or what the multinationals and financiers, financiers will, will allow. Um, another option is uh, to re-envisage some kind of, of uh, Bretton Woods compromise. Of course, this wouldn't be uh, exactly what um, uh, uh, we had under the Bretton Woods period, but this would be an attempt to recreate that compromise where uh, um, you, you re-empower uh, domestic democracies and the nation state and, and uh, allow uh, uh, um, uh, uh, democratic uh, countries to work out their own social bargains and uphold those so social bargains, even if it comes at the price of transactions costs at the border, even if it comes at the expense of, of giving up on the idea of, uh, of, of uh, free, complete free trade and complete capital mobility. Uh, the cost here, of course, is, is that you, know, you have to accept uh, explicitly that globalization must remain incomplete, uh, as in fact the original Bretton Woods Compromise uh, did. Uh, logically, of course, we have a third possibility, uh, which is to simply say, who cares about the nation state? Um, if the problem is what we really value is democracy, democratic deliberation, voice and accountability, and we value the markets, global markets, because of the wealth and the efficiency that they can generate, let's pull politics, let's push politics up to the level of the globe, let's think about some mechanisms of global governance, and let's do away with national sovereignty. Um, the problem with this is, uh, is, is the, the practical problem, of course, is that it requires domestic policymakers to significantly restrain themselves and transfer sovereignty to transnational, transnational or, 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 or multilateral or global governance agencies. But I think the more principled, the more substantive objection to this uh, is that it, it, it undermines uh, the basis for regulatory institutional and policy diversity. Because if the, 
you know, if, if all the financial market rules are going to be determined by the G20 in Basel, all the product market rules are going to be determined by the World Trade Organization and their extensions, uh, then effectively uh, you're significantly reducing the ability of different countries to, uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to implement uh, their uh, regulations, their mechanisms of governance that might differ uh, from, uh, from these. And so that means that every time they institute a rule or regulation in financial markets or in product markets and services, uh, they are potentially uh, uh, in, in violation of global rules, global rules being there, uh, so as to ensure that, that trade and finance can flow smoothly. So this is the, the, the trilemma, uh, and the point is that uh, of these three possibilities, the Golden Trade Jacket, global governance, or the Bretton Woods Compromise, uh, you can both pick at most two, and you cannot have all three of these. Or sort of putting it in terms of first differences, it means that any time sort of you're contemplating a change, you better make sure which one of these three things at the poll, in the polls, you're willing to give up. Um, uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the choice uh, is up to you. Um, uh, when I put this at the beginning of my class to my students, uh, there is a, a preponderance of votes in favor of global governance. Uh, by the end of my class, uh, the number of votes in favor of global governance have, 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 have shrunk significantly. Uh, there's much more, uh, many more people are willing to contemplate something along the Bretton Woods Compromise. And that's more or less where I come out in, in, in the book. Um, I, will, I will simply uh, take maybe a final five minutes just to make this, uh, uh, these choices a little bit more concrete uh, in your mind uh, by showing you how in different parts of the world economy we're actually applying different models um, uh, and doing so uh, not all that consciously. Uh, so example number one is the case where we have you know, sort of uh, um, Chinese exports of toys to the United States uh, you can remember that uh, uh, some years back, it, it turned out that these toys contained very high levels of lead, uh, damaging uh, uh, children. And the question was, how do you deal with this particular problem that globalization creates, which is that you know, you're, you're trading with a country that has effectively a very different set of rules and standards than you. How do you deal with this particular issue? Uh, it was pretty clear how the United States was dealing with this, which is simply to say, if you want to sell goods in our market, you better abide by our rules. So uh, the, the effective model that was applied in this case is the Bretton Woods Compromise Rule, which will say we select our own rules, we have our own let's, uh, content standards. If you want to play in our market, you have to abide by our rules. Um, and it, this wasn't very controversial because every, pretty much everybody thinks that that's the right thing to do. That's, so that's the right model. But it's quite amazing how in many other areas that seem conceptually quite similar, we think that the Bretton Woods Compromise is precisely the wrong thing, wrong model to apply, and we should apply different models. For example, in the area of global finance, uh, now uh, let's turn your attention to not the exporting of toxic toys, but the exportation of toxic securities. Now put yourself in the shoes of Germany, uh, where a lot of state banks and other private banks invested uh, in huge amount of CDOs issued by um, uh, U.S. Uh, financial intermediaries on the basis of AAA guarantees that U.S. Uh, um, uh, credit rating agencies issued. So this was a case where U.S. regulation uh, uh, practices hugely failed, hugely failed not in the United States, but also hugely failed uh, countries that were actually importing these securities. They were engaged in importing toxic, uh, toxic secu <coughs> securities. Now, if you were to apply the principles of Bretton Woods to this case, what would it say? It would say that, well, Germany ought to have the right uh, to decide what its own regulatory standards are in terms of what its own financial uh, um, uh, entities might be able to engage, uh, might be able to invest in, which kind of, of intermediaries it can, it can uh, uh, exchange with. Um, and if it means that, that, you know, that there is some uh, costs in terms of, of international finance that you're going to be interfering in cross-border financial flows, just as in the toxic toys case, that, that be it. 
That's the cost of sort of of protecting the integrity of our own financial regulations, uh, preventing regulatory arbitrage uh, if need be. Uh, that's the whole idea of, of the uh, of, of Bretton Woods. Yet this is in fact totally beyond the pale of any of the current discussions that are going on in the international financial area, uh, where um, uh, the solution to the potential of global of regulatory arbitrage, if different jurisdictions decide to uh, um, uh, settle on different um, uh, regulatory models, is in fact to sort of harmonize these things away, uh, to agree in global fora. Uh, on a global common set of harmonized set of, of standards, as in the Basel Capital Adequacy Standards, or a single set of, of principles for credit rating and so forth. The idea here is that, that it's much more important to ensure that global financial markets are integrated. In other words, we can approximate the hyper-globalization model, if, even if that means that we're uh, uh, pre preventing uh, national economies from erecting financial regulations uh, that might differ from their trade partners for fear that if they did so, regulatory arbitrage would undercut those uh, regulations and trying to prevent that regulatory arbitrage by interfering cross-border financial flows would be a terrible, terrible thing. Okay? So this uh, is a case where it seems like we're approaching a very similar problem in a very different way. Um, finally, uh, the case where uh, importation of uh, imports of, of goods made, let's say, with child labor. I'm using this as an example of where uh, just as toxic toys undermine importing countries' regulatory standards, just like to toxic assets undermine uh, regulatory standards, financial regulatory standards in the importing country. I'm using in the case of, of goods made with child labor potentially undermining labor standards in the importing country. Again, analytically, conceptually, a similar uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, in that case, uh, I think our basic solution today is to apply the golden straight jacket to the importing country. After all, what we say is, this is just another form of comparative advantage. If you try to actually try to protect the integrity of, um, of, of uh, the, the, uh, your domestic labor standards, by imposing some trade restrictions on certain types of goods because of the way that they've been manufactured, uh, then you fact to be violating WTO rules. So you actually you cannot do this. So here the solution is a, is a golden straight jacket solution, which is to say you basically just have to let the market rule and you, you cannot do anything. Um, so uh, these are uh, sort of how in fact these different mechanisms of dealing with the issues, the problems, and spillovers that globalization creates are being dealt with in practice. My claim is that we are not doing this in, a, in any particular sort of systematic, uh, thought out kind of way. Uh, if the global governance mechanism is the mechanism of choice in finance, uh, as opposed to Bretton Woods compromise in health and regulation, it's because relatively who is more politically powerful and what they want, rather than the in intrinsic merits uh, of, of these things. But I think one advantage of making these choices explicit is that it actually also empowers us to think about the, uh, the, the, the pros and cons of, uh, of these different uh, globalization mechanisms. So uh, let me just stop here. Thank you for your patience. I, I look forward to any comments, questions you might have. So I guess we can take some uh, questions from the audience. Please state your uh, name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Phil Levy with the American Enterprise Institute. Um, Danny, very interesting talk, thank you. I ended up a little bit confused, though, on how to interpret the uh, financial <coughs> example. Um, I thought you were initially saying that we had insufficient regulation early on, uh, where it seemed like countries were going their own way. You know the things like the WTO give carve outs for macroprudential regulation. Um, you had some countries that did this well, like Canada and others that didn't seem to do well. And we're currently seeming to move, as I recall from the G20, towards more harmonized uh, global regulation. Are you criticizing where we're coming from or where we're going? 
uh, both. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the problem with where we came from was that I think a combination of things. One is the domestic, there was, there was one failure related specifically to sort of domestic processes and it's a failure in the global one. The domestic failure, of course, was that, that we liberalized um, domestically without enough uh, regu regulation and supervision domestically. Um, and then, so, you know, given that, you know, the United States might have had some version of the popping up of the housing bubble and so forth. It probably wouldn't have been nearly as extreme as otherwise, but, you know, you know that, that would have happened even, I think, even possibly absent uh, globalization. Um, and, 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 and the global failing, I think, was that, uh, you know, remember that the Basel II was in effect then. And I think there was, you know, sort of like the presence of Basel II was partly responsible, I think, for letting domestic regulators off guard. Uh, because the presence of these global standards, as long as you're following these global standards, in fact, in many cases, they were above global standards in terms of capital efficacy, uh, was a sense that you were doing enough. And I think this is one of the main problems about uh, moving the global governance towards the global governance route is precisely it, it creates a sense of fa false confidence that if the common rules end up being, as we are living through this again in the context of Basel III, uh, end up being the lowest common denominator. And now, so as a result, now we have countries like Britain, uh, you know, trying to sort of where, you know, there is a lot of keenness to try to actually have very good regulation going forward. Uh, the problem is, you know, if the Basel III rules are like this, and you want sort of something higher, you know, how are you going to maintain that? Um, and, the, the, and the solution is, well, maybe we can do it for retail banking, because that's sort of more non-tradable, so the potential of regulatory, you know, undercutting arbitrage will be very little. So let's jack up our capital adequacy requirements for retail banking. But for wholesale investment banking, given the competitive pressures and given that the Basel III standards are so much lower, we really cannot impose on our you know, sort of big banks uh, any higher capital adequacy standards than what Basel III really wants or what our trade competitors want. Uh, so, uh, so it's forcing basically a downward revision to go towards some kind of, of common standards. Uh, and largely politically, because of course banks have been very, very powerful in terms of lobbying in the context of the Basel. And I think if there was, if the balance between the setting of these regulatory standards in Basel versus domestic capitals was more in favor of domestic capitals, and there was less willingness to say, well, we need to ensure that all of these things are harmonized through Basel III, I think uh, domestically, conceivably, you might end up because there would be more stakeholders speaking against financial interests domestically, that you might get domestically higher, uh, you know, sort of more stringent regulations, at least in some cases. Um, and, uh, and, and then the question then becomes, well, if you were going to do that, then how do you prevent uh, regulatory arbitrage? There, my answer is, is, again, the same as in toxic toys. I think each country ought to have the tools at its disposal uh, to uh, prevent uh, uh, cross-border arbitrage when uh, that arbitrage demonstrably under, uh, undermines the integrity of domestic regulatory settings. So I would apply exactly the same principle as in the toxic tools. So that would be my, my approach. So I'm not saying that the older, the, the older version was great. The obviously the older version was, was weak too, but largely because of the domestic failure. Uh, thank you, Professor Roderick. My name is Marcel. I'm a current student here at SITES. Um, and my question is, you uh, you seem to prefer the Bretton, the Bretton Woods arrangement. And it seems to me that the actual outcomes of a situation like that would vary greatly. You could have countries that choose bad policies and countries that could choose good policies. So do you judge your, your, your model on the outcomes, or are you making a prima facie decision that, that sovereignty is, is a good idea? Uh, and, and if so, why do you make that decision? Yeah, I mean, I think my my uh, my normative conclusion that we should at this point shift more towards the national level is that I have greater trust I, that I find the governance mechanisms that exist at the national level uh, more democratic, so normatively more desirable than those that are either exist today at the global or multilateral level or are likely to exist at any time. So, my normative preference for moving back for re-empowering nation states, as I've called it, uh, 
is because where we have democratic accountability and voice mechanisms mostly are at the national level. Now, as you say, that doesn't mean that, na that nation states will always get it right. Um, but I would say that, you know, that when they don't get it right, the, the way to fix it is by getting the, dom the, the domestic mechanism of deliberation and policy making right, fixing that often, and not through some you know, external constraint. Uh, because there's no guarantee that the external constraint is always in the direction that some you know, uh, uh, Socratic ruler or some, some you know, platonic guardian would actually want to decide. We think that maybe you know, WTO decisions, for example, aren't designed by sort of well-meaning economists, right? They're the, the result of, of, of also lobbying and bargaining, and often they're the result of, of you know, people that you know, manage to, uh, to get a hold of the, uh, the policy process for their own end. Um, now, there is one point here which I'd like to make, which is that, so take, for example, the case of, of agricultural policy. So we know that agricultural policy you know, it's weird. Uh, both in Europe and the United States, we have very high agricultural subsidies that make no sense from a a uh, a, 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 a um, uh, make no sense from an economic standpoint. But the key point is that, is that these policies, by and large, to the extent that they have an economic cost, the preponderance of these economic costs are paid by domestic consumers and by the domestic uh, taxpayers. Now they have some some consequences for you know, other countries too. Uh, but it is not that we have these policy, these agricultural subsidies in place because these countries just simply want to pay, make other countries worse off. In their democratic you know, wisdom or whatever, you know, these countries have decided to you know, settle on very costly policies themselves. Um, so if we don't like this, as economists, as participants in the policy process whatsoever, I think we, don't, we have to sort of solve this problem dom dom domestically. I mean, this is, you know, it has to be solved domestically. Um, the contribution of multilateral governance or institutions like the World Trade Organization might be to say, uh, look, uh, you know, let's see if we can have standards. You know, the right way to do this is to ensure that the domestic deliberative processes are working well. So let's see the, the, the global constraint might be that, you know, that let's say that when trade policies are being made, uh, that there are sort of various procedural safeguards with respect to accountability, with respect to widespread participation of all the affected parties, with respect to using all available economic scientific evidence. So these things are taken into account. So these are perfectly valid rules for global institutions to say. Less valid, I say, would be to sort of constrict substantively what the outcome of that deliberative process will be, uh, even when those deliberative processes are not necessarily in line with what we as economists or platonic guardians, this or that preference might think is, is, a, is a silly outcome. Thank you. I, I'll speak up, I don't think it's on. Um, can you go back to your trilemma? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because isn't the fundamental missing dimension here power? I mean, the United States can have all three. Germany could have all three. China could have all three. But most other countries are forced into a global trade jacket because they're too small. So is, isn't that... I was thinking about this. You, you sort of assume fundamental agency on the part of nation states that they just pick which one fits them best. Yeah. But isn't that a bit of an illusion? No, excellent point. I mean, you know, I'm putting this, you know, sort of, you know, you can take this and, and do a positive spin on this, which is interpret the change in international regimes from this perspective or where different countries have been located from, from this perspective. And I'm saying, well, that's, that's fine. In fact, I told the story with respect to charter trading monopolies or British imperialism precisely uh, in those terms. Um, but you know, I, I also want to say that we have agency, yes. I mean, that, 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 uh, uh, you know, that when the Bretton Woods regime was designed in 1944, the specific <coughs> shape that it took wasn't 100% pinned down by the fact that the United States uh, was the dominant power. Uh, because it says nothing about, you know, did, did, did the system that came out reflect U.S. interest? It absolutely did. 
but is it the, could you say that it was the only form you could have taken because the U.S., you know, so the U.S., for example, given its reliance on legalism, given its recent experience of the New Deal, uh, given its preference for sort of, you know, uh, um, a, a, a contractual approach, I think, you know, they developed a system that in the end ended up constraining the United States as well. Um, you know, if, you know, it, you know, if China were the dominant power in 1944, the kind of international regime they would have de derived wouldn't have been the same. And, and Keynes made a difference. I mean, ideas, how do you interpret it why the interwar economy collapsed had a lot to do uh, with the rules that you design in terms of capital flows, um, at, uh, for example. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's like this is the fundamental, you know, difference between you know, social science and policy analysis, right? In social science, you just want to pin everything down. Um, and in policy analysis, you just want to leave enough agency that you can say you have some room to maneuver. It's obviously always a combination of both. Hi, uh, I'm Meg Dowd, I'm a student at SICE. Um, some of the best examples that we have of countries developing using the sort of Bretton Woods compromise, like China, South Korea, Taiwan, most of them started from a relatively, or at least a comparatively unglobalized place. So today, when you have a lot of the poorest countries in the world that have already been through IMF structural adjustment programs, they followed the Washington consensus and liberalized, and it didn't work out very well for them, what do you think the potential is for rolling that back to being globalization? So Putting up the mosquito screen after the folks have already gotten in. You stole my line. Um, the, um, <laughs> a good question. I mean, let me let me let me let me play the, the role of devil's advocate and suggest that it's not as bad as you think. First of all, the fact that you are in a more globalized globalized world also brings advantages. I mean, you know, I think the fact that that China's uh, extraordinary growth in the 1980s, and I think in the 1990s, uh, was obviously helped not just by the fact that they were following the right domestic policies to restructure and diversify their economies, creating the base on which they could take advantage of globalization, but also by the fact that during the you know, 1990s, there was you know, a, 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 a fairly open global economy with you know, very sort of rapidly growing volume of trade that they could sort of get on that bandwagon um, and, and so the fact that you have globalization in that sense is an opportunity. Um, it also, you know, the fact that you have access to production networks and the technologies that multinationals have is a huge advantage, because that's where all the technology is. And globalization significantly increases the up, 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 upside potential, because it means you know, that you can access that technology if you're doing your own homework right. So there's definitely that upside that you know South Korea and Taiwan in the 60s had much less uh, uh, to take advantage of. So that's number one on the upside. On the downside, I think you know the, the you know it's easy to 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 uh, to think that we already moved so much into the golden straight jacket that in fact sort of countries that are trying to do a China-like strategy or a Taiwan-Korea type, uh, type strategy can't do it anymore. Um, you know, to some extent that is true because the world trades are, you know, agreement on subsidies, the world trade organizations, you know, agreement on trims do constrain industrial policies to some extent. Uh, but I don't think that in practice the real constraint in the places that I've been um, has been the external constraint as much as the domestic willingness to do this. For, the one, for one thing, for least developed countries, the lowest income countries, they are not constrained by the World Trade Organization. For example, the agreement of subsidies doesn't apply uh, to the least developed countries. So if you're an you know, African country, you know, you're completely free to do what China did uh, with very little, limited constraint. Uh, secondly, you know, even if you're a relatively middle-income country that are constrained by these rules, you know, the fact is that by the time you, know, you come to the attention of some trade partner that's going to take you to court in the World Trade Organization, You've already been successful. It's time to go and do something else. And so, effectively, you know, this is, you know, the fact is that while I'm concerned about the direction of change, uh, today we're still in a position where we're not, you know, 
that the main constraint remains, uh, you know, the, 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 the willingness and ability of the individual nation states to embark on this kind of path and not necessarily the constraints from the outside. Now, having said all of that, I think th there is one big issue, which is that any country that is not trying to do what China does, did 20 years ago, faces the problem of China. <laughs> um, for, and that is a real issue because of this problem of low cost competition from China, which you know, maybe it's becoming a little bit less of a problem as Chinese wages increase, but it's still very much there. It's a major issue because, you know, countries like Korea, Taiwan, and then eventually China, other countries in East and Southeast Asia developed by, you know, sort of growing a whole range of mid-range industries uh, that didn't necessarily became all of them very successful in global markets, but employed a lot of people at high wages and relatively high productivity. Now, if you're an African country or a Central American country, there's no way you can compete with the Asian countries and those mid-range kind of industries. So you have just a few niche export industries, but you're not getting, you're not able to get your people, your workers, uh, into these kinds of, what if you want, the middle class industries that you need uh, uh, in order to basically uh, uh, develop the way that those other countries live. So that's a major issue, and I think, uh, it, and, and, and the implications of that for your macroeconomic policies, for your exchange rate policies, are very significant. Uh, but again, uh, you know, so, so it, it, it's, that question is somewhat uh, different from the question about the rules. Well, I just want to thank you very much, Dr. Roderick, for uh, giving that great lecture, and let's give him a round of applause for coming. No, I'm officially done with classes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much for coming. Thank, well, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, so okay. Thank you. 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 No, 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 I was teaching today, so I can do the And I mean, as I listen to you, what you would say is democratic. And as I read about it, at first it was just a poll that the National Labor Relations Board would tell Boeing that they can't close down a factory one place or another, but that's what I was in France and Germany. And then you read, and apparently the law is quite different. <laughs> 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 So we want to move to a place where we won't face labor interruptions. What's your impression? No problem, just me. Just a picture. Oh, sure. No, no. Okay. Because that's what he wants. One, two, three. That's what he wants.
Thank you. Oh, okay. Is it good? Is it good? Yeah, we are there too with a good chalk chalk and a little chalk glue and chalk tissue. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So this is a good example. It becomes very difficult to maintain that free liquidity of goods and So in other words, you know, that single interim model is contingent on having converged yeah, okay. Sort of a similar on too many things, on, on, yeah. on, a, on a whole bunch of things. Right. And, and or you're possible. going to... <laughs> <laughs> because what they're saying, we don't want to be in a that union state, and the non-union states are drawing all okay. right. And I'm the question is, can the state on a action against that? Right. But you know, this is almost like a repeat of the IDB. And so, and whether it's legitimate and when I first met Tim, to restrict the amount of maximum amount of the other work. Yeah. That's why it's the end. Yeah. You're right. And that's why it's the end. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting how people are coming around. When you first read about it, and then you say, how can I speak? They can't tell the world factory. And then you realize that it's the last bastion of pro-union and how it really is. You don't know. <laughs> but, but it's not a metaphor, I guess, to the federal, except as you say on the convergence, that if it's not convergent, then there has to be democratic process to be allow allow people to. Uh, or you cannot, or you cannot make you know, a common market. So if there was no right, so then the question is. Then, but you see, we created that constitution with interstate commerce just to give people that right, and. Uh, Anyway, it's an amazing yes, right. yeah. we'll see how it works out. Right. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to see you. Thank you. He, he too was in the same I, um, I enjoy uh, your presentation. Actually, I was in that room and I wasn't yeah. able to <laughs> see these slides. Is it possible for me to <laughs> get <laughs> those data? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm going up to well, well, my class. You can dream, Jessica. Hmm? I can dream. <laughs> I'm allowed. <laughs> Cinnamon is dreaming that you'd come and work and teach at science. Yeah, I am I dreaming think. about that. <laughs> yeah. She <laughs> seemed rather content. You came and that we told you to do the conference. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, and that's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Everything went well? Yeah. Great. Probably tomorrow, huh? Oh. Yeah. And uh, my important too, I don't know, we have, a, we have an event in the afternoon. Yeah. Tomorrow. I mean, see if you can fill in for you so you can join.